Hi, it's Tom Gregory here, and if you're looking to write Java libraries in Gradle in the right way, and you want to know the difference between API and implementation dependency configurations, then stay tuned, because today we're going to be getting into a real-life example where we create a Gradle project for a library and also for a consumer, and this project will have API and implementation dependencies, and we're going to really look under the covers to see how this affects things. So. Let's get right into it. Now, before we jump into a code example, it's important to understand the basics of Gradle dependency configuration. And a configuration in Gradle represents a group of artifacts that you want to use in some way, whereas a dependency is a reference to a single artifact that's grouped inside a configuration. So here's an example where we've got a dependency on Jackson DataBind, and that's in the implementation configuration. And just as an FYI, the implementation configuration used to be called compile in previous versions of Gradle, but now that's been deprecated. So if we go ahead and actually look at the class paths that Gradle generates, and we can do this by running the dependencies task, we can see that on the compile class path we have Jackson data bind, but we also have its own transitive dependencies, i.e. artifacts that it depends on. So that includes Jackson annotations and Jackson core. And if we look at the runtime class path, it's the same story. We've got Jackson data bind, Jackson annotations, and Jackson core. But wouldn't it be nice if there was some way that we could have more fine-grained control over our class paths? So we could say that you know not everything needs to be on the compile class path, and everything else can go onto the runtime class path. Well, thankfully, Gradle thought of this, and this is exactly what the Gradle Java library plugin provides us. And if you really want to understand the difference between the API and implementation dependency configurations, you need to understand this concept of the library binary interface, or it's also known as the application binary interface, or ABI. And let's think about when we're writing a library that's used by some consumer. And essentially when we write a library, we create public classes and public methods that are used by our consumer. And the ABI is really the interface into our library that we expose. And you can think of this as public method parameters or return types in our library, or also types used in parent classes or interfaces. So if we're writing a library and we have dependencies, say we've got a dependency that we, we include on our return type from a public method, that means that any consumer of our library also needs to add that extra transitive dependency onto its compile class path. But things that don't fall into the application binary interface include method bodies or types used in private method declarations. So if we're writing a library that has a dependency on another artifact and we're only using that dependency within our method body, then we don't need to add that to the compile class path of the consumer of our library, it only needs to go onto the runtime class path. And having the ability to have fine-grained control of your class paths has a few key benefits. And this includes having a cleaner compile class path, which means that your compile time is going to be less. And also, in your consumer, you're not going to accidentally use a library that you haven't depended on explicitly, because that library is going to be on the runtime and not the compile class path. And also there's going to be less compilation because as artifacts change, you're not going to have to recompile if it's not on the compile class path. And thankfully the Java library Gradle plugin makes all of this possible with its fine-grained control over these class paths. And the way it works essentially is that when we're writing our library and if we're depending on another artifact that forms part of our application binary interface, then we should use the API dependency configuration. We put that dependency on the API dependency configuration. And if on the other hand we depend on an artifact that doesn't form part of our ABI, our application binary interface, then that goes onto the implementation dependency configuration. And this way, we're telling our consumer how it should generate its compile and runtime class paths properly. So I think that's enough theory for now, and we're going to go ahead and create a library and also a consumer of that library as two separate projects. So first up, I'm going to create a project in IntelliJ IDEA, and it's going to be a Gradle Java project. 
and I'm going to really imaginatively call it library. So let's just hit finish here and let's take a look at the build.gradle and you can see it's automatically included the Java plugin. Well we want to replace this with Java library because the Java library plugin includes the API dependency configuration as well as the implementation dependency configuration. And the other plugin that we also want to include is going to be the Maven Publish. And we want to add this because we're going to publish our library to our local Maven repository and then that's going to be consumed by the next project we'll create which is the consumer. And I'm going to change the group here, com.tomgregory and we'll leave the version as it is. Repositories is good. And then in our dependencies, we'll get rid of JUnit here. And we're going to add an implementation dependency on Google HTTP client. And you remember from before that implementation dependencies are dependencies that don't appear on our application binary interface. Whereas we're going to now add an API dependency on Jackson DataBind and you remember that API dependencies are dependencies that do appear on our application binary interface and therefore should be included on the compiled class path of anyone consuming this library. And the last thing we're going to need is a section to enable us to publish and it's just going to configure the fact that we want to publish the jar file properly. So let's go ahead and in source main Java I'm going to create a package and that's going to be com.tomgregory and in there we're going to create a class and it's going to be called awesome service because I only write awesome services and this service is essentially the main interface to our library and it's going to go off and hit a endpoint which returns some JSON and then it's going to return that JSON to whoever calls that method and to save time here I'm just going to paste this in. So here's our awesome service and you can see right away that the get web page method is essentially the entry point. It's our application binary interface and it doesn't take any parameters but it does have on its return type JSON node and up here you can see JSON node is actually part of the Jackson data bind library. So that's why Jackson data bind needs to be on our API dependency configuration because it's exposed in our ABI. Whereas in the method itself we're using the Google HTTP client library to go off to this API here and make a request and then parse it and we're also using the object mapper which is part of Jackson data bind here as well to parse the JSON and then return it as the JSON node. So you can see that the HTTP library is only contained in the method body, it's not part of the application binary interface and therefore it's an implementation type dependency. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to publish this to Maven Local and the way we do that is just by running Gradle W publish to Maven Local and if we have a look now inside our .m2 repository and go to com Tom Gregory library. We've now got our one zero dash snapshot jar has been deployed here and what's interesting to look at is the POM file that also comes along and the POM file is part of the Maven deployment mechanism so even though we're using Gradle under the hood for its artifact resolution mechanism it's using Maven and that's why we've got a POM file which is essentially an XML descriptor and if we take a look at that, we can see in the list of dependencies, we've got Jackson data bind, and then you've got a scope down here, which tells whoever is pulling in this artifact, what class path it should be adding that to. And here it says compile. So Jackson data bind should be on the compile class path, whereas the Google HTTP client down here should be on the runtime class path. So this is exactly what's been set up by the Gradle Java library plugin. So now we've got our library and that all looks good in our local Maven repository. We're going to go ahead and create a consumer of that library. So create new project again, Gradle Java project. And let's be really imaginative here. Um, what could we call it? Uh, let's call it consumer. Consumer, okay. So once again, 
I'm going to go into my build.gradle and this time actually the Java plugin is the correct plugin to use. We don't need to use the Java library plugin because this is our application that's consuming our library. Group, I'm going to change again to com.tomgregory, if I can spell my name. Version will leave as it is. And in our repositories, yes, we've got Maven Central. We will also need to add Maven Local to pull our library from our local Maven repo. So once again, let's go ahead and remove the test compile dependency. And we're going to add an implementation dependency. And that's going to be on group com.tomgregory. And the name was library. And the version was the same version we've got here, which I'm going to copy. And the version is 1.0 snapshot. And what we'll do is we'll add a package here com.tomgregory and we'll create a class and let's call that do stuff and what this do stuff class is going to do is call the awesome service that is exposed by our library and if you remember the awesome service is going off and it's actually hitting this web page which returns a really simple bit of JSON that just contains one status field with value 9 so we're going to get that back as a JSON node and then in this class we're going to inspect the status field. So I'm just going to go ahead and create this as a public static void main method and we're going to have an awesome service definition in here. Awesome service and we're going to say awesome service dot get web page dot and this is the JSON node exposes dot get and you can put in a field name so we're going to get the status field and we'll say status field equals and then I'm just going to print that out system out printer len status field and we just need to add the exception type to the method signature and we also need to add a two string on the end here so let's run this and we can see here that we have the expected result of 9. So this looks great and it seems that our consumer is using our library and it's producing the expected result. But let's make doubly sure that it's creating the compile and runtime class paths correctly. So the way we can do this is if I open up a terminal window here, we're going to run Gradle W dependencies and into this dependencies task you can pass a configuration and we want to see the compile class path. So here we can see the compile class path contains Jackson data bind and the transitive dependencies of Jackson data bind annotations and core. So first thing to notice is that we don't have the Google HTTP library on this. Whereas if we go ahead and query the runtime class path you can see we've got Jackson data bind but we also have Google HTTP client and all of its transitive dependencies there. So this shows that we've got a real distinction between the compile and runtime class paths and our compile class path is kept as clean as possible. Hopefully you can see by this point that using the API and implementation dependency configurations exposed by the Java library plugin provides a really nice way of keeping your compile class path clean. And it might seem like a small difference at first, but once you start getting into bigger projects where you've got multiple libraries and you've got multiple consumers of each of those libraries, I think it can really mount up to a big difference. And you'll remember some of the advantages like quicker compile time. So thanks a lot for watching. And if you like this video, please hit the like button and do subscribe to hear about other related videos on interesting topics in the future. But otherwise, I'll see you next time on Tom Gregory Tech.